Oklahoma sky had gone rogue. Inky black clouds roiled overhead, spitting lightning like a furious god. Wind howled like a banshee, whipping rain against the windshield of my trusty rig, Bessie. Visibility was down to zero, the headlights carving a pathetic cone of yellow through the deluge. This stretch of I-40 was notoriously bad in storms, but tonight was different. It felt malicious. Fear gnawed at the edges of my mind, a gnawing hunger that had nothing to do with the stale gas station sandwich I had choked down earlier. Then, a flash of lightning, brighter, whiter than any I'd ever seen. It illuminated the side of the road for a fleeting moment, revealing a sight that sent a jolt of ice through my veins. A shimmering portal, a swirling vortex of fire and brimstone, had ripped open the very fabric of reality. Panic clawed at my throat. This wasn't a hallucination brought on by fatigue in the storm. This, this was something else entirely. A voice, deep and booming, echoed across the desolate highway. It wasn't human, but somehow I understood it perfectly. Lost soul, it rumbled, burdened by regret. Seek solace. Seek oblivion. The shortcut awaits. My breath hitched. Memories, long buried in the recesses of my mind, surged to the surface. Memories of a reckless night, a screech of tires, and a life snuffed out in an instant, my fault. The guilt, a constant companion for the past five years, tightened its icy grip on my heart. The voice boomed again, its tone seductive, promising. The past can be erased. Peace awaits beyond the flames. The temptation was overwhelming. Five years of crushing guilt, a life consumed by regret, escape, oblivion, sounded strangely appealing. I could leave it all behind, the wreckage of my past, the scornful whispers that followed me wherever I went. Bessie, sensing my hesitation, lurched forward. The stone raged outside, but within the cab, a silent war raged between a sliver of sanity and the seductive whispers of oblivion. It's not that easy, a voice, barely a whisper, rasped from within me. It was the voice of reason, buried beneath the weight of guilt, now struggling to be heard. There's no escape from what you've done. The fiery portal pulsed, beckoning, promising a sweet, fiery oblivion. I closed my eyes, the image of the mangled car, the horrified face of the victim, flashing behind my eyelids. Another rumble of thunder, closer this time, jolted me back to reality. Bessie sputtered, the engine coughing in protest against the storm's fury. The radio crackled to life, a frantic voice breaking through the static. Truckers on I-40, be advised. Strange lights reported near mile marker 127. Avoid the area, if possible. Mile marker 127. That was, here. My heart hammered against my ribs. Other truckers were seeing this thing too. The voice boomed again, its tone laced with a hint of impatience. The offer stands, soul. But time is of the essence. With a shaky hand, I reached for the microphone. My voice, when it came out, was a hoarse croak. What, what happens after? The voice hesitated, a flicker of surprise crossing my mind. There is peace. There is forgetting. The answer was vague, but so was the offer. Peace could be another word for oblivion, and forgetting could mean the eternal erasure of my soul. Was that a price I was willing to pay? Just then, a deafening crack of thunder split the sky, and the fiery portal flickered, its edges starting to fray. The storm's fury seemed to be weakening, and with it, the portal's hold on reality. A decision had to be made. Succumb to the temptation, walk through the flames, and erase my past, my guilt, everything? Or face the consequences of my actions, the whispers, the judgment, and carry on living with the burden? The flickering portal, a gateway to an unknown hell, was a stark metaphor for the path I had strayed down five years ago. The easy way out, the escape hatch, always seemed tempting. But it wouldn't solve anything. With a newfound resolve, I gripped the steering wheel. No, I rasped into the microphone. I don't accept your offer. The voice boomed one last time, laced with a hint of fury, foolish moral. You choose suffering over solace. But remember, the past cannot be undone. With a final crackle of energy, the fiery portal imploded upon itself, leaving behind a faint wisp of smoke and the lingering scent of sulfur. The rain continued its relentless assault, but the wind had died down. 
A sense of calm settled over me, a fragile peace earned through a difficult choice. Bessie sputtered back to life, groaning its way forward. Reaching for the radio, I reported the incident to the authorities, my voice shaky but firm. They dispatched a team to investigate, but warned me that weather conditions might hamper their efforts. The next few hours were a blur of police questions and anxious waiting. Finally, the storm subsided enough for them to locate the scorched patch of ground where the portal had been. Their findings, as they relayed them later, were inconclusive, a strange energy signature and traces of an unidentified substance. No sign of the demonic voice, of course. The incident changed me. The guilt remained, a constant shadow, but now it was accompanied by a flicker of defiance. I wouldn't let it consume me anymore. I continued to drive, Bessie my loyal companion, the open road stretching before me. Every time I passed mile marker 127, a shiver would run down my spine. The memory of the portal, the seductive whisper of oblivion, served as a chilling reminder of the consequences of my actions. Perhaps that was worse than any punishment the fiery gateway could offer. The whispers surrounding my past never entirely disappeared, but they grew fainter with time. I began volunteering at a local mad chapter, sharing my story to warn others of the dangers of reckless driving. Maybe it wouldn't bring back the life I took, but it was a start, a way to try and make amends. The fiery portal on the highway might have been a figment of a storm-battered mind, or perhaps a glimpse into another dimension. Whatever it was, it served as a stark reminder, the easy way out doesn't exist. True redemption lies in facing your demons, carrying the weight of your actions, and choosing the right path, no matter how difficult. The road ahead was long, but for the first time in years, I felt a flicker of hope, a faint light guiding me through the darkness. Let's hop on to story number two. But before I begin reading, make sure that you have subscribed to Mr. Scare for regular horror podcasts. The Nevada sun beat down mercilessly on my trusty rig, rusty, its chrome paint shimmering like a mirage in the desert heat. My usual route took me through the bustling I-15, but tonight, with boredom gnawing at my sanity, I decided to take a gamble. A lone figure stood by the dusty exit ramp, silhouetted against the setting sun. It was a man, lean and weathered, with a worn trucker cap pulled low over his eyes. He looked like a seasoned veteran of the road, and seeing him hitchhiking tugged at a nostalgic memory of when I used to do the same thing years ago. Headed anywhere in particular, he rasped, his voice rough as sandpaper. Vegas, I replied, surprised at my own willingness to pick someone up. But honestly, anywhere but this endless desert would be a welcome change. He grinned, a flash of white teeth in his tan face. Me too, friend. Me too. But what if I told you there was a way to get there quicker? A hidden highway, untouched by the rules of the regular folk. Intrigue sparked in my chest. Hidden highways were trucker lore, whispered stories around campfires, usually dismissed as tall tales. But the man's conviction was unsettlingly real. Hidden highway, huh? I said, more to humor him than anything. Spill it. To my surprise, he leaned closer, his voice dropping to a conspiratorial whisper. He spoke of a network of abandoned stretches of road, bypassed by the modern highways. Taking these backroads, he claimed, could shave days off travel time. The idea was ludicrous, yet a seed of doubt had been planted. Days saved meant more money earned, more time spent with my family back home in Georgia. My mind wrestled with the conflicting impulses, trucker's pragmatism and a gnawing sense that this might be a bad idea. Seeing my hesitation, he pressed on. Look, I understand if you're skeptical. But trust me, this ain't your mama's highway. It's faster, quieter, just you and the open road. But first, you gotta prove you deserve it. Gotta follow the signs. Literally. He scribbled cryptic directions on a scrap of paper, his eyes glinting with an unsettling fervor. Then, as abruptly as he had appeared, he vanished into the gathering dusk. The encounter left me rattled. Logic dictated I should continue on my original route, but a part of me, the part weary of the same old monotonous miles, yearned for something different. Curiosity, or maybe a touch of recklessness, won me over. I followed the man's instructions, turning off the well-maintained highway onto a deserted dirt road. The landscape morphed from familiar desert scrub to a desolate wasteland. 
The road itself was a crumbling ribbon of asphalt, cracked and overgrown with weeds. Billboards materialized from the dusty haze, their faces displaying warped, faded advertisements for long-forgotten products, petrify your pet. The newest craze. A shiver ran down my spine. Ghost towns emerged abandoned gas stations with flickering neon signs, their convenience stores frozen in time, shelves stocked with outdated snacks and dusty magazines. The silence was oppressive, broken only by the groaning of Rusty's engine. Then, the man was gone. One moment he was sitting shotgun, the next, he was simply, empty space. Panic clawed at my throat. This wasn't just a hidden highway, it felt like a trap. The further I drove, the more warped the landscape became. Twisted trees clawed at the blood-red sky, and the air crackled with an unseen energy. Fear turned my blood to ice. The hidden highway wasn't a shortcut, it was a dead end. A purgatory for those who strayed from the beaten path. The last ray of sunlight faded, plunging me into a terrifying darkness. Rusty sputtered and coughed, its engine protesting the unnatural environment. I slammed on the brakes, the rig screeching to a halt in the middle of nowhere. The radio crackled to life, a distorted voice whispering in a language I couldn't understand. My phone was dead no signal reaching this desolate corner of reality. Trapped on a highway to nowhere, with a sense of dread gnawing at my soul, I realized the truth. There was no escape from this hidden highway, no easy shortcuts in life. The price of my curiosity might be eternity on this desolate road, a constant reminder of the consequences of straying from the path. The midday desert sun beat down on my beat up rig, old blue, turning the dusty highway into a shimmering mirage. My stomach rumbled, a reminder of the stale gas station sandwich I'd choked down earlier. A glance at the GPS confirmed my next stop, a one-horse town called Desolation in the middle of nowhere, Nevada. Desolation. The name itself gave me the creeps, but according to the map, it was the only place with a gas station for the next hundred miles. My trusty diesel engine sputtered a warning, low fuel. I didn't have a choice. As I approached desolation, a foul odor assaulted my nostrils. It was a sickly sweet stench, like rotting fruit mixed with something chemical. It made my stomach churn and my eyes water. Through the windshield, I saw a deserted main street lined with empty buildings. Cracked sidewalks led to boarded up windows and peeling paint. No cars, no people, just an unsettling silence. The stench intensified with every passing second, choking the air and making it difficult to breathe. Reaching for the air freshener hanging from the rearview mirror was a futile attempt. The sickly sweet odor permeated everything. Suddenly, my radio crackled to life, a distorted voice barely audible over the static. Don't stop. Keep driving. Don't breathe the air. The voice repeated the cryptic message three times before fading away. Panic clawed at my throat. My instinct screamed at me to get out of there, but what if the voice was right? What if stopping was worse? I slammed my foot on the gas pedal, old blue groaning in protest as I accelerated down the deserted street. Every building I passed seemed to hold a hidden secret. Forlorn mannequins stared vacantly from dusty shop windows, their faded smiles mocking the desolate scene. A tattered welcome banner flapped listlessly in the non-existent breeze. The stench clung to me like a shroud. My eyes watered, and my throat burned. Coughing, I reached for a bandana I kept stashed in the glove compartment, hoping to filter the putrid air. The distorted voice crackled back to life, more forceful this time. Don't breathe. It gets in your lungs. A horrifying realization dawned on me. Was this some kind of biological hazard? A forgotten government experiment gone wrong? My mind raced with possibilities, each one more terrifying than the last. I slammed the windows shut, gasping for air through the bandana. Old Blue rumbled and lurched, its engine straining on the neglected road. But even with the windows closed, the stench permeated the cab. Sweat trickled down my temples, mixing with the tears streaming down my face. Just when I thought I couldn't take it anymore, the town limits of desolation came into view. Relief flooded me, a desperate hope that the nightmare was over. But the relief was short-lived. Beyond the town limits, the road was blocked by a makeshift barrier of old tires and twisted metal. There was no detour, no way around. 
panic turned into a cold dread. I was trapped. The distorted voice echoed one last time, laced with an unnerving sadness. They warned us, but we didn't listen. Then, silence. An oppressive, suffocating silence that seemed to amplify the stench a hundredfold. I was trapped in a deserted town filled with an unknown, deadly gas, and whatever fate befell the poor souls who lived there. With a desperate cough, I slammed the gear into reverse, praying there was another way out of this desolate nightmare. The Wyoming night was a black canvas, punctuated only by the occasional glint of a distant star. My trusty rig, Bessie, rumbled along the lonely stretch of I-80, the radio crackling with the usual static and trucker banter. But then, a flicker of movement in the far lane caught my eye. Squinting, I saw a group of figures huddled around something on the side of the road. Curiosity nodded me for a moment, but something about the scene felt off. Against my better judgment, I slowed down, peering through the windshield. My stomach lurched. It wasn't a roadside breakdown, it was a scene from a nightmare. Three figures, clad in grime-encrusted clothes, were hunched over something on the asphalt. As my headlights illuminated them, I saw a sickening realization. It wasn't a car they were scavenging, it was another human being, flesh-torn and bone-exposed. The figures, their faces contorted in a grotesque feeding frenzy, were cannibalizing the body. A primal scream clawed its way up my throat, but it died in my lungs before escaping. Panic flooded my veins, turning my limbs to lead. My foot slammed on the gas pedal, Bessie roaring in protest as I lurched forward. There was no time for questions, no room for empathy, only the desperate need to escape. But fate, it seemed, had other plans. A sickening cough, a sputter, and then silence. Bessie's engine died, leaving me stranded in the middle of nowhere with a pack of ravenous cannibals hot on my trail. The figures looked up, their eyes gleaming with an unholy hunger in the moonlight. One of them, a tall, gaunt man with a shock of greasy hair obscuring his face, let out a guttural roar and charged towards me. Adrenaline surged through my system, momentarily overriding the terror. I fumbled for the tire iron stashed under the passenger seat, its cold metal a sliver of hope in this waking nightmare. The man reached me in a heartbeat, his stench a nauseating mix of sweat and decay. He lunged, his raw, calloused hands reaching for my throat. With a desperate cry, I swung the tire iron, connecting with a sickening thud on his shoulder. He howled in pain, staggering back a few steps. But the respite was short-lived. The other two figures were upon me now, their feral eyes locked on me. One, a woman with wild hair and vacant eyes, lunged at me, her outstretched hand aiming for my face. I sidestepped her attack, the tire iron flashing through the air as I swung it again, connecting with a sickening crack on her arm. She screamed, a high-pitched shriek that echoed across the desolate highway. The fight was a blur of adrenaline and fear. I swung the tire iron, more in desperation than strategy, fending off their attacks. Each blow landed with a sickening thud, the metallic tang of blood mingling with the stench of their bodies. One of them, the first man I'd injured, lunged at me again, his eyes filled with a murderous glint. He grabbed my arm, his grip like a vice. Panic threatened to consume me, but the image of their gruesome feast flashed in my mind, giving me a renewed burst of strength. With a roar, I brought the tire iron down on his hand, the sickening crack of bone sending him howling in pain. He released his grip, stumbling back, clutching his mangled hand. The remaining woman, her face contorted in rage and pain, charged at me with a blood-curdling scream. This time, I was ready. As she lunged, I sidestepped, slamming the tire iron into her knee with all my remaining strength. The sickening crunch of bone echoed in the night. She crumpled to the ground, a whimper escaping her lips. The injured man, his face contorted in fury, started to rise, but a blood-curdling scream from the first woman made him turn. A pair of headlights emerged from the distance, growing brighter with each passing second. A police cruiser, its siren wailing, screeched to a halt on the highway. The remaining cannibals, their feeding frenzy interrupted, looked at each other in a flicker of fear. Without a word, they turned and fled into the darkness, disappearing into the vast emptiness of the Wyoming night. The police officer, a young woman with a wary expression on her face, approached me, her gun drawn. 
I slumped against the side of Bessie, the tire iron clattering to the ground. My entire body ached, but a sliver of relief washed over me. I was alive. Relief morphed into a wave of nausea as the reality of the situation hit me. The stench of the feast lingered in the air, a grim reminder of the nightmare I'd just escaped. The officer kept her distance, understandably cautious. I explained the events in a choked voice, the terror still raw in my throat. By the time reinforcements arrived, the only evidence of the cannibals were tire tracks leading deeper into the desolate plains. The police found the remains of the unfortunate trucker, a gruesome scene that further solidified the horrifying truth. Days later, news of the incident spread like wildfire. Theories ran rampant, a deranged cult, a new strain of drug-induced psychosis, even rumors of a rogue government experiment gone wrong. The authorities launched a manhunt, but the vast landscape of Wyoming swallowed the cannibals whole. For me, the scars ran deeper than physical injuries. Flashbacks of the fight, the stench of death, the feral hunger in the cannibals' eyes haunted my dreams. Bessie, after a thorough cleanup and engine repair, became an unwelcome reminder of that night. Every deserted stretch of road, every flicker of movement in the dark, triggered a wave of gut-wrenching fear. The trucking community rallied around me. Truck stops offered free meals and counseling sessions. Veterans of the road, with their own stories of close calls and dangers, offered support and understanding. Slowly, I began to piece my life back together. The nightmares lessened, replaced by a newfound vigilance. I never forgot the night on I-80, the monstrous secret hidden beneath the cloak of the open road.